Hey everybody, Will's <laughs> Will's gonna start here in a second. And uh, just so everybody knows, we are gonna have a microphone to pass around for Q and A. And so, and I have a volunteer in the back. So if you have a question after he's done, or if he wants you to interrupt during his presentation too, that's fine as well. So anyways, Will, had a lot of fun, Willie. Okay. I look forward to this one. I don't think it's going to work. Okay, thanks for coming. So my name is uh, William Weston or Willie Weston. Um, I uh, wanted to kind of talk about how uh, drones are being used and uh, what we need to kind of be prepared for as far as drones being used in warfare. Um, we're kind of reaching a threshold uh, of how uh, unmanned vehicles or uh, autonomous vehicles are being used in warfare and uh, we're not super sure where it's going to go. So um, just to kind of introduce myself, uh, I work at a company called Black Sage. It's a local company that produces counter drone systems uh, or counter UAS systems. Uh, we make uh, prototypes and then bring them to production for militaries, governments, police forces. And uh, we, we go out in the field, we test this stuff. We're, we're constantly looking at what drones are being used, uh, what drones could be used, and uh, a lot of education at the customer. So I've had a lot of uh, experience explaining um, all the different systems and capabilities of drones. So uh, here I am today ex explaining uh, a lot of similarities uh, to you guys as well. Maybe a little more general overview though. Uh, so to give you some examples of some of the systems that we've built, uh, we build some tower systems that can uh, sense the drone um, uh, pretty far out. And then uh, from there, it can kind of lock onto it and take it out uh, by a couple different means. And we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. So uh, we built big towers, small towers, tactical systems, uh, you name it. But we've had a, a lot of experience with um, some high-end equipment and seeing what is feasible as far as taking out drones. Um, so uh, if you've ever seen uh, UAS or uh, UAV, it's uh, unmanned aerial systems or unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, so I'm in the CUAS space, which is the counter unmanned aerial systems space. And we're going to kind of dive deep into what is a UAS, what is a drone, and uh, how it kind of started. So um, really early on, back in 1935, uh, the British actually developed a pseudo drone. I think that more, more than anything, they developed uh, the concept of a drone. So um, they took an old, you know, prop plane and and made it remote control. Um, you know, at the early heyday of uh, radio control systems, and they used it as target practice um, rather than putting a, a guy in there and and you know jumping out with a parachute. They just flew this in the air and made it easier for uh, the other pilots to, to target practice with this one. So um, super early on, and then we're going to jump over about 50 years to uh, kind of what the first modern drone uh, became to be. And this was an Israeli-made drone. Um, the Israelis were actually really the, the first uh, country to pioneer drone, drones themselves on manned aerial systems. Um, and so this was the Scout. This was a, a fairly successful drone. And uh, the main difference between this one and just being, a, you know, like radio control with, with a, you know, toggles and a controller, this actually had a, a live feed with, with the camera. You can kind of see on the, the underside uh, of the, the fuselage, uh, there's a full camera system in there. So they can use this for uh, reconnaissance. And that's where the name came from, it being a Scout. So um, from there... Uh, about a decade later, we looked at, uh, we're, we're now actually trying to develop these drones uh, domestically with the U.S., but this is in partnership with Isra Israel. Um, so right here, the, the Pioneer uh, was kind of the first successful uh, U.S. drone, um, very similar to the Scout. And you'll end up seeing a lot of the 
drones being used today of this similar shape and design. Um, this ends up being uh, fairly economical because uh, we're not going super fast with these drones. Uh, so you've got this kind of twin tail uh, set up with these drones. So uh, from here, we're, we're mostly still looking at uh, reconnaissance uh, missions with these with a, a infrared camera so they can see at night. Um, and then relaying that information back. So instead of sending someone out um, in an actual fighter jet or a plane or something and, and risking being shot down, they, they can send this guy out and uh, just send a live feedback of what's going on downrange. And then about uh, another decade later, this is kind of what uh, I'd say most people would think when they say a, a militarized drone. This is the MQ-1 Predator. Um, this was made by uh, General Atomics and uh, ended up being one of the, not the first, but one of the main um, successful drones to be weaponized. So this is what's got uh, payloads on as far as missiles, rockets, um, bombs, you name it. And this is uh, what really opened up as far as capabilities of, of drones being used in war. And uh, what really started to funnel the money into this R&D is as far as developing these drones um, and then I've got smartphones on here. So we're kind of reaching this tipping point where we've got, uh, you know, weaponized drones um, that are being used. We've got the technology for it, but they're still ran, ran off of uh, a gasoline engine. Uh, smartphones really kind of paved the way for what consumer drones uh, are, are kind of identified today, right? So a smartphone, you can kind of think of it, but before the smartphone, we didn't have small cameras, small batteries, small displays, small computers. Um, this really accelerated the, the idea of a, a small drone or what's capable of a drone itself for a very affordable cost. So um, what we're seeing here during the two, early 2000s of uh, smartphone development, sure enough, 2010, we see the first consumer drone. Um, so this is something you can go to Best Buy or Amazon. You buy a drone for a couple hundred dollars and you actually control it with your smartphone, right? So um, this is starting to bring down the cost uh, of a drone and then starting to roll up the, the R&D for, for small drones themselves, right? So these are lightweight, they're made out of like styrofoam and plastic. Um, the, the motors are fairly easy as far as development goes. It all comes down to, you know, battery technology, uh, the, the amount of computing for, for IMUs as far as balancing the drone with, with multiple rotors and all that. So um, this is the, the very start of that. And then a couple of years later, you, you see DJI come to the market. And when I say drone or when you, you hear drone from anyone else, you're probably thinking of a DJI Phantom or a Mavic. Um, this is the stuff you can go to Costco and buy very easily and it's super easy to get. So. Um, we've got, we want to kind of a medium sized drone to more advanced, large, you know, drone that's about the size of an actual aircraft back down to a drone that's about the size of your hand. So, um, when it comes to drones, there's a pretty wide range of what's actually available out there, uh, which makes it harder for my job because we have to make systems that can also cater to that wide range. Um, and so a couple, I'd say about a decade ago, the department of defense um, and NATO came up with a way to classify uh, the sizes and capabilities of drones. But even this list right here and the NATO list is a little out of date uh, because we're seeing drones that have, you know, capabilities of the larger group or lar larger class size drones, but still be classified as a smaller group, right? So as battery tech increases, as um, you get a little more creative with the design of the drones and how we're using them, um, a 20 pound drone can all of a sudden have a speed that could exceed over 288 miles per hour and could go above 4,000 feet. So, um, this is something to maybe take more of a grain of salt, but it's still a good, um, still a good base to kind of understand what size of drones are out there and what capabilities are out there and what the military is actually kind of worried about. Um, because they'll obviously be worried more about of a, be more worried about a group five drone than they would be worried about a group one, but they have different capabilities, uh, different mission sets. Um, so to give you an idea, here's the, the NATO class. Um, so very similar as far as classifications go, um, you know, they're mostly worried about uh, operating altitude, how high can the drone fly, 
normally. This is not the max altitude. This is the, the normal operating al <clears throat> excuse me, altitude. Uh, a higher altitude will uh, decrease the range quite a bit. A higher altitude will also decrease the payload. So um, these are the, the altitudes where they just kind of be cruising to, to get to their target. And then the max weight, how much can they hold? And you can kind of see here between uh, the NATO and the, the DOD classification system, uh, if it's over 15 kilograms, so over, you know, 32 pounds about, um, it, it doesn't really matter at that point. It's kind of more the operating altitude and the range, whereas we go look back at the DOD, um, they're actually kind of worried about, you know, some of the max weights, what are the payload capabilities? And they're a little less worried about the operating altitude and then a little more worried about the speed. So, um, you can kind of see how it gets really convoluted, um, in classification. And, and at the end of the day, it almost doesn't really matter. It's, you know, what are you trying to protect? What are you trying to, uh, take out? What sort of capabilities are you looking for? So there's a lot of variables we have to worry about when it comes down to drones and, um, what it takes to make a drone or fly a drone or take one out. And what I've got here on this next slide is a little bit easier. So rather than just a, a grid with a bunch of numbers, you can actually get an idea of the, the different sizes. Um, but also I, on here, I've got a pretty wide range of different countries that are making drones. And um, these are kind of the more common used drones that we're seeing today. And uh, especially being used in the, the Russian-Ukrainian war. Um, these are all active as far as drones go, uh, but gives you a good range. So just really quick, we'll, we'll go through the, the DJI Mavic. Um, this is the stuff you get at Best Buy or Costco. It's a group one uh, or a, a micro drone. The AeroVironment Switchblade, it's a uh, definitely a more militarized drone. It's something that gets launched out of a tube. Uh, that's still kind of a group one, but it's got some group two capabilities. It's classified as a mini, but it's got some small capabilities. Um, the Zala Aero uh, KYB, that's uh, right on the edge of like a group two NATO small. It's a, a, also a loitering munition. Uh, the UA Dynamics Punisher, uh, that's also a group two. A um, little more reconnaissance uh, rather than a, uh, a loitering munition. Uh, the the Bayraktar TB2, that's a... Uh, a Turkish made drone that's been uh, very effective in a lot of recent conflicts. Um, that's kind of on the upper end of uh, group four, reaching group five territory. And then uh, General Atomics MQ-9 Reaper, uh, that's kind of the biggest drone that's out there. There's a, a couple other ones like a Global Hawk um, and another one from uh, Bayraktar. But uh, as far as drones go, this is about the size of a fighter jet. I mean, the there's no need to go for anything bigger at this point. So we'll go from here. This is the, again, the Bayraktar, the TB2. Um, Turkey's had this for quite a while. Um, they've been developing this drone out and uh, doing iterations on this drone. And it's a, it's a weaponized drone. So this one's actually been used uh, quite a bit in the Ukrainian conflict. Um, you know, Turkey has been sending a lot of these drones to Ukraine. Uh, to get a better idea um, of what they're dealing with as far as reconnaissance goes, but they've also used it to, to take out some tanks and um, supply lines. So uh, to give you an idea of what's going on here, um, we've got a, a couple pictures of the actual uh, drones that are being used and, and how they're being used. So uh, you've got some command uh, and control stations with, uh, let's say, radio uh, radio antennas to connect with the drone over a long distance. Um, and then they can fly the drone out and with a live feed, they can actually enact, um, the drone, the drop down payloads to, to take out enemies. And from that, you can start seeing, uh, the capabilities of, of the drones themselves. Um, it's not very expensive. The, the TB2 in comparison to a fighter jet is a fraction of the cost. Some of the infrastructure might take a little bit more, uh, time to get set up versus a fighter jet, uh, just cause you have to do a lot of training and, uh, a lot of, uh, spare parts and sort of stuff like that. It's still fairly new as far as war conflicts go, but it, it shows that they're very capable for how little they actually really cost in comparison. Uh, so next we'll talk about, so this is the Zala, uh, KYB UAV. This is a Russian made, uh, loitering munition. And a, a loitering munition is, if you ever heard of like a kamikaze drone, it is a, uh, 
essentially a smart bomb or a flying missile that you can control. So it's got munitions packed inside of it. This is something that they you would just send up off of a, like a catapult or something. Uh, some of them you can just hand launch and just throw them like a paper plane. And uh, they can fly good range and get to the, the spot where you need. And then they essentially just go down on target and explode off of the target. So um, we've seen a couple of these in the Ukraine um, Russian war. Uh, there hasn't been any confirmed casualties from it. As far as what I've seen, um, they've been used uh, ineffectively. So they've been um, more often than not failing before they reach the, the, the actual target. Um, and here's a couple pictures of it. So um, you can kind of see as far as what's inside of them and uh, how they're being used. So on the, the left, they've got some metal BBs that are packed in. And the idea is when this thing explodes, um, it doesn't need to explode right at the target. It just needs to explode near the target. The, uh, the actual metal BBs would act like shrapnel and uh, take out whatever it needed to. Uh, a couple other drones that we've seen uh, during that Ukraine-Russian conflict. Uh, this is a uh, Israeli drone, actually. The IAI is the, the company that you saw um, early on that developed the Scout. And the one on the right is a, a very similar uh, iteration of the Scout itself. But uh, Russia bought these you know, five years ago, uh, seven years ago um, from Israel. And they've gone out and they started to use them. Uh, this isn't a weaponized drone. This is what's used for uh, reconnaissance as well. Um, but we're already seeing you know, a, a lot more activity uh, of drone warfare in the last month. Uh, another one that Russia's had and developed in-house for a while, it's called the Orlin 10. Uh, this drone is actually not as uh, weaponized where it won't carry any sort of bombs or payloads, but this is being used for electronic warfare purposes. So um, on board, they'll have jammers or they'll have a um, uh, RF uh, detection capabilities as far as picking out uh, radar systems from the enemy and stuff like that. So uh, we haven't seen too many of these as far as uh, them taken out because they're usually flying at a pretty high altitude. And for how small they are, it's fairly difficult to actually find them and take them out. Um, but there's no doubt that they're being used. Uh, here's another one. It give, kind of gives you another uh, idea on the, the size and, and range of drones that are being used in this conflict. So uh, the TU-141 uh, shows a picture in that, that square on the, the left right there um, of a crashed one. But this is a jet drone, uh, a fairly basic drone. They kind of use this for reconnaissance, but uh, more often than not, because of how cheap it is, they'll actually fly this out and start testing some uh, anti-aircraft systems of the enemy. So um, it's much cheaper to send this out and see, okay, what's out there? Are they actually picking up any sort of you know large targets like this and are they able to take it out? Um, so it kind of gives a, a way, kind of like a sniff test for uh, the Russian military to see uh, what the Ukraine's capable of. Here's another one, um, the Eleron 3SV. It's another Russian-made drone. Uh, they show a picture of it being captured, but this kind of gives you an idea of all that's really needed to deploy and fly a drone. Uh, we consider this like a man-portable uh, setup where you can put it in a couple cases in a backpack, throw it in the back of a truck or a Humvee or something, and uh, launch it from the ground with one or two guys. So. Uh, it's a catapult launch drone. Uh, it's, you can kind of see on the right there on the underside, there's a, a ball cam right there. Uh, it's an EOIR camera is what we call that. So it's electro-optical infrared. And that way it can see during the day and at night, uh, again, for reconnaissance. And then going to the other side of what we're seeing in Ukraine, this is the UA Dynamics Punisher drone. So this is a a drone that was made by a company that started after the Crimea uh, invasion uh, a couple of years ago from a bunch of hobbyists. Uh, their goal was to make a very cheap and affordable drone for reconnaissance, but also for uh, weaponization. So um, what we're seeing here is a, a, a drone that's not terribly sophisticated, but can change the, the tide of war for very little cost. Um, and we're seeing that uh, more and more often, especially when you have conflicts like this. Uh, and then what I've got here, this is the Aero Environment Switchblade 300. There's a 600 version that's a little bit larger, um, but the 300 is what I'm pretty sure uh, what we recently sent over about 100 of these to Ukraine, 
uh, about five days ago, I believe is what, when it was announced that we were sending this. So this is a, a tube launch drone. Um, the wings themselves fold out as they come out of the tube. I think I've got a picture of that there. Um, not sure if it's an actual picture or it looks more like an illustration, but um, this is a very tactical drone. So you can send this um, with a single person, you know, on their back and they can launch this out. Uh, this is also considered a, a loitering munition uh, in the sense of it's kind of a one way trip. You could recover it, but um, the idea is to send this out and have it detonate on target. Um, wanted to show a couple of these pictures here too. So, you know, you'll have militarized drones, but we also have here just the DGI, Costco, Best Buy, um, Mavics and Phantoms that are being used and they're being used for reconnaissance. Um, and the kind of the scary part of drone warfare is we're not really sure where it's going to go and how it's going to be used. And this is a perfect case because people are using off the shelf drones that they're, um, able to get at the store or able to get on Amazon. And they're starting to use these uh, in conjunction with other weapons. So, so we've seen a couple instances where uh, both sides are using, you know, cheap consumer drones for targeting of mortars, rockets, uh, weapons that typically are fairly dumb. You aim it in a direction and you kind of can do some parabolic math to, to figure out or ballistics math to figure out where it's going to land, but with a drone like this, you can send it down range and actually see where it's landing and start adjusting where you want to start firing the, these mortars. And all of a sudden these mortars become far more effective and far more dangerous. And all it took was a couple hundred dollar drone. So, um, that kind of shows what is capable, um, as far as using drones and, um, how uh, important it is that we need to take these out. So I wanted to also show this. Uh, kind of shows how we're using drones with other uh, new technology advancements. So the idea of using a Starlink system uh, or a satellite internet in general uh, for controlling drones or relaying information um, just shows how critical even just small, cheap drones can really be uh, in an area to make other weapons more effective. So I'll get a little bit into the counter UAS space. Um, so what does it actually take um, to find those drones, figure out what they are, take them out? Um, and as he kind of phrased it, it's fairly difficult because it could be a small drone the size of your fist and it could be a, a drone the size of the room. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, the, the drones that we n normally worry about are the ones about the size of my fist and the ones probably uh, I'd say about 12 feet um, wingspan. So uh, there's definitely the bigger drones like the Predator or the Reaper. Uh, those are drones that are able to be detected and taken out by more traditional air defenses. We're worried more about the, the smaller drones where there's not really any air defenses that have been created for that. So uh, again, to give you an idea, we when we make a drone system, we want to make sure that we're comprehensive and being able to detect detect, track, identify, deter, and defeat. Um, and that means we're able to have a layered uh, solution as far as different sensors, different effectors, uh, and being able to find the drone, uh, track it, figure out is it a you know friendly drone or is what kind of drone is it, um, or is even if it's a drone at all. Um, and then from there, we can either deter it, so, you know, uh, essentially send it away or neutralize it for a second or take it out completely. Um, so to kind of give you some examples of what uh, detect systems are out there, um, everything's a box that we deal with. Uh, it just depends on what that box could do. So as far as detection goes, um, we're trying to pick up a drone um, through a couple different means. Uh, in a, more often than not, we're using uh, systems called passive RF, and that's kind of a, a it's a word that's kind of made up in the counter drone industry. But essentially, what it is is it's an antenna that's trying to find the radio uh, frequency signal of the drone, and from there they can either say, "Hey, there's a drone out there," or "There's a drone in this direction," or "There's a drone right here." Um, so from there, we can kind of detect and see what kind of drones are out there. If there's any, do we need to heighten our sentences? Do we need to start looking in that direction for the, the drone itself? 
Um, and then from that kind of early warning detection, we can start using some other systems to track it. So typically we use uh, radar to track drones. So that, that'll actually give us a position of where a drone or multiple drones are at in any given sense. Um, and from there, we start bringing those tracks in and uh, can start using cameras to identify uh, whether it is a drone or not. Because as far as radars go, they don't care if it's a drone or if it's a bird or if it's a car, anything that moves, it's going to get picked up by the radar. And we can only do so much to kind of filter and find out what are drone sized things or things that are capable of movement of a drone. And that can be pretty tricky. So uh, from going to a track to an identification, we use uh, cameras and more often than not uh, mid wave infrared cameras. Uh, these cameras, we can basically see these drones as hot spots. Whether it's a gasoline powered or a battery powered thing, they emit quite a bit of heat. Um, and that's one of the, the weaknesses of a drone, I'd say. No one's really worrying about trying to make it um, cooler or trying to cover the, um, the actual heat signature of the drone because that either means more weight or a less efficient drone or both. Um, so from a, with an infrared camera, we can usually see these drones um, pretty white hot on the screen. Um, so, all right, you've been able to detect, track, and identify the drone. You know the drone's right there. Um, you either can decide, okay, I need to take this drone out because it's an enemy, or I don't need to worry about this drone. It's a, it's a friendly. Um, but from having a, kind of that gray area where you're not super sure where it might be, maybe you just want to deter it, not defeat it. Um, and so with uh, deterrence, we start looking at uh, jammers. Uh, so radio frequency jammers, we're looking at uh, a lot of different ways to do that. Um, and as far as the, the examples I have here, we, we typically worry about only a couple bands, uh, a couple uh, radio frequency bands that are commonly used. Uh, so Wi-Fi is a very common band. It's a 2.4, 2.5 gigahertz spectrum. Um, and we also worry about GPS. So if you're flying a DJI drone, you're going to be using both of both of those sets of frequencies, uh, your Wi-Fi frequencies is what you're using to control the drone, what you're also using to get the video feed back from the drone to your handset or your, your goggles. And then the, the GPS is where the drone is able to figure out where it's at or where you're able to figure out where the drone's at. Um, and both of those have to be used together to fully neutralize or deter that, that drone itself. Uh, when we start looking at more sophisticated drones, more weaponized drones, um, they usually have non-typical uh, radio frequencies, uh, military bands. And so that just means we need to be uh, more comprehensive in being able to jam those on those other radio frequencies as well. Um, and here I've got a couple pictures of what's being used in Ukraine right now as far as what I've been able to, to, to see and share. Um, a lot of it is handheld jammers, so they look like guns, but they're essentially antennas with uh, uh, RF amplifiers and noise generators attached to them, which is essentially what a, a basic jammer is, uh, but they are directional. So uh, they're able to point this and turn this on at a drone and it essentially deters it and neutralizes it. Um, the only problem is, is it's only a neutralized and deterred when you have the jammer on. As soon as you turn that off, the drone is back up and working theoretically. So. Uh, you can see here on the left picture, you, one guy's got the drone jammer and the other guy's got a machine gun. So uh, typically when you neutralize a drone, especially a quadcopter, it just kind of hovers in place. It's a sitting duck. So uh, this gives a good example of what's how these jammers are being used in the field and uh, what it actually takes to take out a drone itself. Um, here we've got a, another version of a jammer. This is a backpack jammer. Uh, they're using dipole antenna, antennas. So they're non-directional um, basically the guy can have it on his backpack while while moving or can just set it down and turn it on um, this is a not as long of a range effect but it's a uh, omnidirectional effect so it's going to work in every direction uh, the only downside is it's actually going to neutralize uh, your signals as well if you're running on the same frequencies so um, it neutralizes everybody not just the drone and then from the deter, we look at the, the defeat. So the defeat, it's got a couple different ways of going about it, and we're still trying to figure it out. It's a very complex uh, problem because 
with traditional uh, anti-aircraft systems, okay, you've got a multi-million dollar jet you're trying to take out and you've got a couple hundred thousand dollar uh, missile to take it out with. Okay, that sounds like a you know a feasible task uh, economically. But when we're looking at drones, where the drone's a couple thousand dollars, you don't want to use that couple hundred thousand dollar missile to take it out. So we're trying to figure out, okay, if they had a bunch of drones, how do we actually take this out economically? And so we start looking at um, some more sci-fi options. So on the left here, the top and bottom pictures are high-powered lasers. Um, so these lasers are actually ta are targeting these drones. And once they've locked onto them, they lays them out of the sky. So uh, they're not super high power, but they're high power enough to start burning a hole through the laser, through the, the drone itself. Um, some of the metal drones are a little trickier, but typically a lot of drones are either fiberglass or plastic or styrofoam and have no problem being melted out of the sky. Um, and what we're also looking at uh, alternatively, in the top right is a machine gun, which is a kind of a no brainer, of course, that that would work. But um, having a machine gun being so precise for such a small drone at distance is what's kind of a fairly difficult thing, especially if you want it to be automated. You know, you don't want to have a guy sitting there making sure that it's, it's on point. So uh, these systems still have quite a ways to go to be, to be practical, and you're still using up uh, ammunition. So there's a lot of cost to keep these going, or is something like a laser, you just need power and need to be able to you know support it and repair it if it breaks down but they essentially can just run they, they don't cost anything more than the the energy itself um, and then what we have on the the bottom right here is a, a render of a high-powered microwave so this is a uh, directed energy weapon also called and uh, what we're doing is we're sending a, a directed emp uh, towards the drones to short the drones internally and take them out that way. Um, and again, that's no ammunition, you just need power, but these still have a long ways to go as well as far as uh, reliability, um, feasibility. They're fairly large to get anything that's a certain distance away. Um, so there's still a lot of unknowns as far as what could be used for defeat. Um, and then in addition to all this, we're also looking at drones themselves. So. Um, this is also not as effective as the other ones. There are, it's kind of a rat race to see what's going to be the most effective, but I'd say this is probably going to be the most promising, and this is what's going to be used in the future, is using a drone itself to take out another drone. Um, so you can see here on the, on the left, uh, this drone is a one that's being developed domestically. It is a drone that would ram into another one, um, and then theoretically land itself. It isn't damaged it, its own. Uh, and then the ones on the right, we're seeing two different versions of uh, net drone guns. So the one on the top is uh, actually firing a net um, on a drone to take it out. And then the one on the bottom right has got a net that's just always deployed, um, just being draped and it flies into the drone. Um, I'm a little skeptical on the net drones. The, it sounds like a good idea, but the, the only demos that I've only ever seen of these being used is the enemy drone itself is either going nice and slow in a straight line, or it's just hovering in place. Um, so I think there's still a long ways to go, but this is likely going to be the solution as the, the drones themselves are also fairly, uh, fairly cheap uh, when you compare it to like a high power laser or a microwave or a machine gun. And uh, that I'd say it ends my presentation. So I've got uh, several minutes open for questions as I figured there would be quite a few. <laughs> so I have two questions on the first one is about the is that better all right my first question is the uh, reliance on uh, trying to block a GPS and or a Wi-Fi signal and you mentioned about the consumer being fairly easy but they're also being military channels. Sure. My question is, that seems like a great game of cat and mouse, it right? Is. If yeah. I knew that your detective or prevention systems to, to counter my drone is to go look for my signal, why would I just go hijack the, hijack the existing signals that are uh, used by the enemy 
and or do a uh, you know uh, an encryption of my signal using their signal. How would I be? How would you be able to, to um, not have an, an effect of taking out your own communication systems if I'm using or hijacking your own? Sure. Um, let me try and uh, rephrase that so I can answer that question completely. So, your uh, the, the question is is if uh, I'm emitting a jamming signal, am I jamming myself? Or is it when I'm emitting a jamming signal, how do I know that I'm actually being effective to the enemy drone because they could be encrypted or using a different frequency? Well, if I'm attacking my uh, a drone and it's using my own communication band, sure. would I not be then jamming my own signal? Totally, yeah. So there's a couple different ways around that. Um, and it, Typically depends on you know how important is it for your drone to be used in the certain in that same space compared to an enemy drone. And typically, when we're looking at base defense, um, you don't have a lot of drones being used uh, locally um, where you're trying to protect a drone coming in. Um, a radio frequency uh, jamming, you can kind of think of it a lot of the ways of uh, how actual sound works, and it's very localized. So. Um, you can be directional with these jamming devices. It doesn't have to be omnidirectional and you can be fairly directional with it. So it's only, you know, in this small little beam is being affected with a communication. Um, alternatively, you're also don't have to worry too much about jamming a drone of your own if it's way far away, because what's going on is you've got um, your actual RF communication going on and talking with that drone way out there but this drone's right here. And you're trying to just sever the connection of that drone with wherever its connection is somewhere else. So it's not always gonna be perfect, but uh, more often than not, we have the ability to be very directional so we don't have this collateral damage effect on our own stuff. So that leads right into my next question then, is the impact of, instead of having an AI, right? You, know, you just closed off talking about how the future may be drone versus drone wars. Totally. So now you got all these drones in close proximity, some sort of AI uh, programming in there to help them be able to interact. Mm -hmm. And uh, but again, there's still this need for communication back, right? And then how does that not escalate into you showing the Elon Musk Starnet? How do you not just start just attacking the communication networks that they use? Yeah, and so there's a lot of cat and mouse um, in the communication. Uh, networks as far as you know what's a little more robust versus what's being attacked um that's constantly going back and forth as far as encryption or different frequencies um and they are at targets it's electronic warfare it's been around for quite a while i think since vietnam was kind of the first um initial starts of electronic warfare um but to answer the the other part of the question as far as like a like an autonomous drone right um, we're seeing a lot of drones, especially the, the bigger drones, they have uh, INSs, it's uh, inertia navigation systems. It's basically, hey, if I've lost connection, I don't know where I'm at, I don't have any communication. Um, I'm able to say I'm going this speed, I'm at you know this altitude, I'm not banking or anything, I'm not being moved around, I'm, I should be somewhere here on the map. Um, or it's got a camera on board, right? It could fly via the camera and as cameras get um, better and as we have uh, more robust and advanced computing systems that can use, um, is it visual algorithms? I'm blanking on the word, but uh, able to actually pick up where it's at just from the camera. How do we, you know, fight against that? Obviously, a RF jammer is not going to do it. But still, from what we've seen during this Russian-Ukraine conflict, it's all RF based, and it will be for a while because it's uh, economical. It's feasible. Um, it's readily available. Um, we are worried about autonomous drones and what's kind of coming on in the future, um, but we don't need to quite worry about them yet. Um, I think we're still probably another decade before they're more often used. And uh, But again, it's just a game of cat and mouse and trying to figure out what's the biggest problem today and what's the problem in the future so we can start preparing for it. But um, it's not a huge issue right now. I hope that answered that, that question. If there was maybe something else I missed. Okay.
good presentation. Thanks. So, uh, you know, what's what's your sense on uh, the direct? I mean, so there's the version of the cheapest uh, commodity style, mm -hmm. you know, deployment, and then there's you know, the, then there's escalating capability. Um, do you see it more going towards like a race towards the bottom and just straight volume? You're having to fight volume, or is it more like okay, well, so you're saying it's going to be drone on drone, and now are we equipping these drones with greater sensor arrays and uh, you know versions of autonomy where it's something like a heat seeking missile? It's like okay, well, I lost communications, but I've already identified the target, you know, for, uh, target location yeah. of, of the target drone. And I can fly myself there. And, and then go, you know, do some kind of small explosion and take it out sure. or whatever. So then are you, then are you, okay. You, you know what I'm saying? Do you see that ratcheting up or is it going to be, no, let's just get all the small drones out there. It's kind of a mix. Yeah. It's, it's a, just everything. Right. And that's kind of, again, not really sure where it's going to go because it's going to just ha happen naturally. And we're not really sure what that natural evolution is going to be. Um, but we're seeing both. So we're seeing drones that are being equipped with these sensors that are being able to uh, crash into another drone autonomously or carry out its mission autonomously. Um, but when you start outfitting that drone with sensors and computers, you need a bigger battery. Okay, the drone can't go as far. It's got to be way more expensive um, to be that capable of being able to be autonomous. Um, on the other side, we're starting to see, you know, more drones and this concept of a swarm is also a thing. So <clears throat> you, you might have a situation where, all right, if you had 30 or 40 drones coming at you, how do you take them all out? Right. If I lost half the drones, well, the other half can still carry on the mission. No problem. Right. And you can make them really cheap and send them out. We haven't seen that too often. Uh, because that is a fairly complex situation to be able to control all those drones all at once. Um, but it is a, it's a worrisome thing. We saw it at Burning Man. And, you'll, you'll, and you're right. Yeah, you see that with drone light shows, right? Um, and these drone light shows uh, are typically, they've got a base control station um, that are connected to each drone, but it's all pre-programmed off a of GPS. Uh, there, sometimes the drones will actually have uh, a way to talk with each other and say, hey, I'm you know this far away from you or that far away from you, but that's not as common. Typically, it's an all pre-programmed GPS thing. So, okay, you take out the GPS and now you're done. Um, but they're getting more advanced and every single way can, can go. Eventually, they will be fully autonomous and full swarm autonomy. And <clears throat> how do we take that out? Okay, you know, localized EMPs. Is kind of what we'd be looking at next and there's some drones that are being developed right now that have localized emps on them themselves so you could send a drone a friendly drone out with an emp and say hey there's a swarm right here there's a drone right here fly over there and get near it turn on the emp and then once the emp is done fly back here and recharge um, so we're seeing that that concept being used we're seeing you know the directed energy weapons being used um, so again, it's a lot of cat and mouse game. We're not super sure where it's going to go. Um, we kind of have to be prepared for everything. But what happens more often than not is once an actual technology is being used in the battlefield, that's the priority. Um, and we're not seeing swarms being used as much. We are seeing cheap drones being used effectively because they're easy to get. People will use them because you can get them on the internet. Um, it's harder to develop this stuff in country to be robust and um, ubiquitous, you know, in every conflict. So, development then probably for the uh, aggressor, it's going to be mission dependent on which strategy. Mission have. dependent, uh, economically dependent, um, technology dependent. Um, you know, a lot of aggressor states won't have the ability to get these GPS modules as easily as as other states or. Um, they won't be able to get these cameras um, like these other states. So it, it, there's a lot of factors that come into play for sure. Um, and we'll just have to kind of see where it, where it goes. Very fluid. Yeah. Uh, I just had uh, one question. Uh, does this uh, conflict in Ukraine show that for many smaller countries, building and equipping an air force is becoming uh, sort of not a good idea where they could devote 
a lot more resources into buying several hundred drones versus one jet and trying to maintain that jet? Uh, and is that where many of these countries should be looking towards in, in the next few years instead of depending on a superpower and their willingness to supply them with jets or not, no jets, right? Mm -hmm. I think we're we're kind of getting towards that threshold. Um, we're not at that point just yet. It's still take it takes more people to actually fly a drone than it does to fly a, a fighter jet, um, just because of all the infrastructure that's needed and the checks and balances and the we're still kind of figuring it out. It's still relatively new. Um, we haven't invested a lot of R and D and a lot of support as we have with like fighter jets, um, but it is showing the capabilities of drones, and it doesn't take that much to actually turn the tides. Um, a good example was the Azerbaijan Armenian conflict that happened a couple of years ago, um, and that that war was going on for I, I think uh, several months or so, and then all of a sudden, um, Azerbaijan. Uh, bought uh, several of those uh, Turkish TB2s, a couple other drones from Bayraktar. And uh, I think in as little as six months, the conflict was over. They, they were able to take out um, Armenia with, with those drones and it was showing the capability of, okay, if you get a couple cheap drones, you all of a sudden now have an air force and you don't have to train all these different pilots and all that. You can train a couple pilots because if one drone goes down, okay, jump in the other seat, you know, in the, the command and control room and turn on the next drone and start flying that or have it at standby. It's already up in the air waiting for you. So um, we're, we're very close to that tipping point where all of a sudden pilot and fighter jets don't make any sense. And we're starting to see that with uh, some of the bigger companies too. Um, there's this concept of a, a loyal wingman, and that is a autonomous drone, the size of a fighter jet, the capabilities of a fighter jet, but it's basically flying an escort with a flight fighter jet. So you'll have some a pilot in a jet it's themselves uh, flying, and they'll have you know a small uh, little group of drones flying with them, and they can okay have this drone go out there and check out something, have this one go out there and start interacting with that enemy have this one here, you know, go over here and start, um, you know, actually enacting electronic warfare. And um, so we're seeing a lot of hybrid systems where drones are being used with more traditional systems and aircraft. Um, we're not quite there where it's like, stop spending your money on a traditional uh, aircraft, traditional fighter jets and start spending it all on drones. But what we've seen in the last month is uh, far more drones are being used than fighter jets, and I think that's going to continue to be the case. Could be, yeah. The uh, the F thirty five, um, it's a multi mission fighter jet. It's yeah, um, it, it could be one of the last you know highly developed ones, but we'll have to see. Yeah, in the spirit of Packport and breaking into things, I would imagine that like it's probably more like of interest to like hack into a drone and take it over mm -hmm. than to like take it out. I could be wrong, but so in that process, I think there's a lot of potential value in identifying spe the specific hardware that you're dealing with. So can you like, I'm just curious what the work is being done in like signal processing or like how do we identify what drone is like flying and vibrating through the air at us so we can like see what we could do about it you know yeah there's actually quite a bit of hacking going on um it's only because that's a very uh easy way to deploy a system it's literally a box with a couple antenna out of it and you turn it on and you can start using it it's not this big crazy thing that's got radars and all this infrastructure that's required to support it um on the flip side though uh all those uh we'll call them uh protocol manipulation uh devices and what's going on is uh they need to be able to have that drone within its library we're not quite at the point yet where we're able to on the fly hack into a drone. Uh, we got to be able to first 
um, decipher, okay, hey, I've got a, um, I've got a communication, uh, a radio frequency communication that's going on and it's a drone that matches something in my library. Cool. Now I've got to be able to say, how do I decrypt this communication and how do I um, emit, you know, the same encrypted communication on my end at a higher power. So the drone starts listening to me and not the actual controller it's being used, but it's a fairly, it's fairly costly to maintain and develop because it's got to be almost on a per drone basis. A lot of the different companies will use different protocols and they'll come out with different drones. And if they decide to change that encryption a little bit, you now have to figure out how to change your encryption a little bit. So, uh, there's a lot of that going on, but it's a very costly thing and you got to be up, you know, every day on the updates and what's going on and how to, how do I stay on top of this? So it's another tool, but it's not a full blown way to handle this situation. Um, we have seen a couple instances where we're seeing a, it's kind of a hybrid system where I'm not fully going in and figuring out how to control the drone, but um, I could have, you know, a, a very large library and say, hey, that is a non organic, you know, RF communication. And if I'm in a situation where I'm really just don't want anything to mess with me. Um, I can whitelist some communications for like friendly comms. And if a new one pops up, Hey, that's, that's weird. And I'll start and you can go out and you can take a snippet of that communication. And then you can just start blasting and repeating that snippet. And you might get lucky where you'd be able to say, Hey, you know, that drone just got a control to say turn left or something. And I was able to catch that communication copy that communication and, and start spitting it back out. Now the drone's just turning left and you're starting to mess with it. So uh, there's ways to be a little creative on that sense. Um, and that's a little more adaptable in the field where you can start picking up new stuff that you've never seen before and start messing with it. I was wondering if you could train crows or hawks to uh, go at them. Yeah, no, totally. So uh, there's there wasn't a, I'd say an attempt um, in Canada at an airport uh, where they actually had uh, some uh, falcons uh, being used to um, identify drones in the, the airport airspace and go out and take them out um, to some you know significant success. It's not a uh, widely feasible you know situation, but it has been proven to work, and it's not. Um, as far fetched as you might think, it's it's a feasible thing, but of course it's gonna depend on your you know environment and are those hawks or falcons gonna be able to work, you know, twenty four seven and what sort of you know success rate do they have? I don't think anyone's really gotten that in depth with it. Um, plus the infrastructure and all that. So it's not a crazy idea because it has been proven to work, but um, I, I think most people wanna try and use a you know, automated robot to try and take these drones out versus a, an animal. It, it hasn't happened at least once in a while. Yeah, it's happened a couple times. We've actually, so we have our test range out in uh, Notice, Idaho, and we've flown some of our uh, uh, fixed wing drones out there for testing our system. And we've had some hawks go out there and I think they've been successful one time where they've been able to take out the drone. So it's a styrofoam drone. It was able to, um, I think, break the wing off. So. It, it's happened before. Cool. Well, I think that'll end the presentation unless anyone else has a question. Oh. I do, I do have one super quick question. So yeah. you talked about all the drones and everything, but I'm just kind of curious on that last note that you had about you guys doing testing. What is it specifically that, that you guys do? Oh, okay, so yeah, we make uh, counter drone systems. So um, specifically what I do is uh, like a hardware integrator. So I'm figuring out how to make the glue that attaches all of our sensors and effectors together into one system, uh, whether it be a really big one or a really small one. Um, we're using uh, sensors from other vendors, radars, uh, antennas, cameras, jammers. Um, we've dealt with lasers, we've dealt with machine guns, high power microwaves. Um, and we're seeing what combination works the best for the widest variety of situations. So we're doing a lot of evaluation and testing of these sensors and effectors. 
And then on top of that, we're trying to figure out, okay, this certain combination works best for that situation or this environment or for this customer's budget. So um, there's a lot that has to be factored in as far as what, what it takes to build a system. It's still a fairly new field. The market's growing every couple months. There's a new sensor and we have to constantly be on top of it. So what we're doing is we'll put together a prototype system, send it out in the field and start flying against it. Different drones, different situations, different angles, speeds, you know, multiples, all that. So we're trying to uh, make a, very, a really robust system. And through that, we've gained experience of what a robust system actually is. Uh, what systems are being out there currently. We do a lot of demos um, and competitions with other companies in, in the U.S. Um, and internationally to see, you know, are we stacked up against some of these other companies? And so far we've been pretty good, uh, but we're still kind of an underdog in the sense of we're a smaller company and um, it's not always the performance, but it's sometimes the, the networking that gets you the deal. So um, we, yeah, we try to handle that whole system, but we don't make any of the sensors. We just integrate them uh, because it does take a huge range of sensors uh, to be comprehensive and layered. So one sensor might not pick it up, but another one will. And if that sensor can pick it up, sweet, then you can pass that along up the chain to the camera, start tracking, identifying, and, and going on the next. Okay, thank you. And then quick follow-up from that. Do you guys mostly focus then on taking out other drones or more defending uh, your own drones? Uh, no, about? taking out other drones, okay. yeah. we. Uh, we don't have any we we have the ability to link a drone to our system but more often than not it's just you don't want any drones in this space you're not flying your own drone you want to just take out another drone so that's what we're focused on okay gotcha and i know final tiny question but that's cool for a boise company to be doing all this stuff internationally but how big are you guys uh we're not fairly large uh we're under 40 people right now uh as far as uh, employees go um, but we're, we're located here uh, downtown, our main office. And then we again, go out to, to notice Idaho for testing as well as down in mountain home, uh, air force range and do some work with those guys and, and testing down there. Um, we're backed by a, a larger, uh, uh, VC company, but fairly small, um, as we're still just figuring out how to do this. Thank you so much, Willie. Let's give him a round of applause. All right. Thanks everybody for coming out. We're going to change over here. Next one's going to be fun.